those of you wondering what this break from your regularly scheduled programming is, I am the great man's co-host on the less popular podcast also shown on this channel. I've got something a little different for you today, however, rather than the opinions pulled out of my ass on the podcast, and that is carefully selected opinions pulled from my ass for a video. I've been contemplating blessing the masses with these bush talks for a while on every other topic but footy, but it was that disgusting sight known as Derby 58 that has reawoken me from my football slumber. Not only has that Derby reawakened me from my football slumber, but I'm hoping it inspires me to do more of these bush talks where I rant about anything that comes to mind long enough for me to research and produce a video on it. So if that's something that the people may be interested in, please engage in the comments and let me know any ideas for that sort of direction. I'd muchly appreciate it. I, however, fortunately do not have to research for this video because I have watched every second of that disaster of a game unfold live on television and I have lived in Perth my entire life so I have enough of a connection to the history of these two clubs to have arriven at the unfortunate conclusion that has inspired me to make this video. Those of you who know me from the podcast probably know that I'm a massive basketball nerd and it's from my background in basketball that I have unfortunately come to the conclusion that the Dockers are the Los Angeles Clippers and the Eagles are the Los Angeles Lakers. There are several reasons why I've come to this conclusion. First off, I'd like to make a comparison between the Eagles and the Lakers. I have a few notes on that in my book here. First off, I'd just like to highlight the fact that both the Lakers and the Eagles have had incredibly successful teams over the years for the entire history of their respective franchises. For example, West Coast has the equal second most flags in the AFL since the 1990s when it was all put together rather than just the VFL. Cop that Carlton fans who count all their pre-AFL flags. Compared to the Lakers, who I believe are still second in NBA championships behind the Celtics, they might have equaled them with the last one, but don't quote me on that either way. Either way, both clubs have proven to be incredibly successful throughout their durations in their respective leagues. This was also a slightly surprising one, considering the existence of Collingwood and their popularity, but it turns out the Eagles actually have the most members of any club in the AFL. And from a basketball perspective, it's quite safe to say the Lakers have the most fans in the NBA. There's that many Lakers homers, it's bloody ridiculous, but I'll digress on that one. It even just comes down to something as simple as both teams having the same sort of blue-gold, similar colour scheme being West Coast-based teams, and just the consistent success and revenue and respectability of both teams. It's an unfortunate conclusion for me to come to as a Dockers fan, but unfortunately it just seems to be the reality of the two teams in town. And the Eagles get to be the big boy Lakers in this particular instance. Another similarity between the two clubs I'd like to highlight before I go into why the Dockers are in fact the LA Clippers is that both teams, the Lakers and the Eagles, have been able to draft generational stars just at the right time to continue that sustained success. For example, the Lakers or someone like Jerry West incredibly early in their franchise and then they took Magic Johnson in 1980 which led them to the Showtime Lakers in that period of success. And then they took Kobe Bryant in the 96 draft and that led to the present period of success until the LeBron era that was trade-in, but that's not relevant for this. Compare this to the Eagles who were able to draft people like Matera early when they set up the 92-94 premierships, people like Matera, some of the other big names they had there. Then they were able to draft someone like Chris Judd who led them into that next successful era, the 05-06, really being a good competitive team franchise. And even though I've only watched this man play for two games of his entire life, I'm almost prepared to put Harley Reid as the next shining example of that franchise player that's going to propel the Eagles to their next period of success. (sighs) That was a hard one to say. Now I'm going to get into my least favourite part of this video, and that's going to be comparing the Dockers and the Los Angeles Clippers. Initially, both teams were the team that came to town later. They, the other two teams that existed before us were well entrenched in their towns. And as the usurpers, it was always going to be difficult to make up that ground, which is something certainly that shares between the Dockers and the Clippers. Another painful one to lead to is that neither team has found the ultimate success since their inception in their respective leagues. The Dockers haven't won a premiership, and the Clippers have not yet won the NBA Finals. 
another similar thing between the two teams is trade, draft, mishap after trade and draft mishap throughout the years. Some notable examples of this for the Dockers would be when they traded the rights to Luke Hodge and Sam Mitchell for a Trent Crowe rental and Luke McFarlane. That's one of the all-time classic ones to bumble. They also bungled the recruitment of Andrew McLeod relatively early in the team's existence. The Dockers have attempted several other home run hit type trades to try and accelerate rebuilds and that sort of thing, but have never panned out. A good example of this for the Clippers is when their first successful player they tra- drafted, two years later they traded him for a first round pick and a vastly inferior player. That sounds like something exactly like the Dockers would do. And then once they traded that player, they turned into an all star. They had three first round picks one year, the Clippers, and they bungled all three of them. They've just been known to make mistakes, also known to try and put all their chips in, go for a home run trade and mess it up a lot. Finally, each team has had that period where they've teased the potential to have that ultimate success. Both teams have had one era where they've illustrated this, Lob City era Clippers and the Ross the Boss 2013-2015 era Dockers. In fact, both teams are up and about at the exact same time, so that kind of shows the sync between the two teams quite nicely, unfortunately. (laughs) This is actually a part of the video that I didn't plan, but as I was sort of recording it, I was still sort of thinking about why, in spite of everything I've just said about the Dockers, that I'm still loyal, I still love them. One part of that is just that underdog mentality of just having the circumstances against you from the outset, a big established team already in town that you're trying to compete with. And we've just given it a crack year after year, so that's something that it's commendable, I kind of relate to, and it's one of the many reasons why I continue to support the team. Another reason why I'm still a Dockers fan is because when we finally do pop that Premiership cherry, it's just going to be like the first time you've done anything that you've enjoyed in your life. It's going to be like the, that feeling that you have when the, it's the first time you've done it. It's what hooks you. It's what makes you passionate. And when we experience that after all the trials and tribulations we've faced as a team over the years, oh, I'm going to have to make a Metro's Frio comeback that evening. Hopefully it's at a stage where I have an age to still have some dignity showing my face at Metro's, but even if I'm bloody 60, I'll be there. Another reason is just sort of simply that just ingrained loyalty to the area of Fremantle, just like... That's sort of something I'm sort of seeing the Clippers try and do now rather than just try and play in the same place as LA, sort of just literally being the little brother. They're sort of trying to establish themselves in different parts of Los Angeles, sort of, so those people in those areas have an identity that they can sort of buy into and invest in the Clippers. That's something where the Dockers have been quite lucky and they've always had that as a team, just the area of Fremantle, the people, the attitude, the fact there was two very successful waffle teams from the area... It just sort of fed into Freo having that sort of culture that I'm sort of seeing the Clippers try and emulate now. So for the Clippers' sake, I hope they can succeed and find people half as passionate as bloody Freo people. A key component to the idea behind these Bush Talk videos is the idea of the good, the bad and the ugly. The main reason I came up with doing these Bush Talk videos is just felt like an avenue for me to shit on the things that I don't like. And don't get me wrong, two-thirds of the segment is still dedicated to that in the bad and the ugly. But while I was pondering that, I also came to the conclusion that it is important to highlight the good things, give you some further perspective, just sort of... And just the simple fact to understand that not everything in this world is shitty. And that leads me into talking about the good from Derby 58. From the perspective of a Dockers fan, I'd just like to say Luke Ryan and Alex Pearce were their usual brilliant selves. And that's about all good I have to say about Fremantle. Ah, shit. I think I'm going to have to say something nice about the Eagles here, aren't I? (sighs) Jack Williams, he's Freo boy. He kicked a very nice goal. I've liked what I've seen from him getting in the Eagles seniors team. I hope he continue to build and be a good player for them. I was always a fan of Jack Williams in that draft. I think I was hyping him up quite considerably at the time. I wanted Freo to take him at that pick 20 where we ended up taking Johnson. So that's how big a fan of Jack Williams I was. Oh, what else can I say? Oh, yeah. Another East Freo boy, Elliot Yo, winning the Derby medal. It's great to see Elliot Yo back in some good form because 
We need these eaters peak. He's an outstanding football player, one of the best around. He's just got that unique blend of athleticism, have a crack and get in, do what he needs to do. So it's great to see him healthy and back on the park. Oh, yeah, I've only watched him play two games, but from what I can tell from last week and this week, the bloody Eagles have got themselves a star in Harley Reid. Sheesh. I saw him do something Judd-esque in that first quarter, and I'm not talking about the chicken wing he did to get that free kick either. So, yeah, Harley's one to look out for. And even in the former number one pick in the mid-season draft, Ryan Marich, he looked pretty good. I was impressed with him as a bit of a link-up, third tall. I think he's someone who can contribute something to that Eagles team in the future, so that's nice for them, bloody beautiful. Now I can get into actually doing what I want to do, and that's shit on the Dockers. And here we go. Let's get into the bloody bat. First off, just that late first quarter and the whole second quarter where the Eagles just piled it on the bloody Dockers. And then for the rest of the game, I just felt like bloody Homer Simpson watching his pig go disappearing at the barbecue. But he just going, it's still good. It's still good. As things get progressively worse. Dirty. It's still good. It's still good. It's just a little slimy. It's still good. It's still good. It's just a little airborne. It's still good. It's still good. It's good. I know. Another issue that I have that I sort of felt was bad is that there's probably a few too many passengers for Freo. It's sort of hard to and died a couple of people specifically, but just people who can do a defensive job on someone, but just their disposal's just very inconsistent. A few just general skill errors. And the other frustrating thing was there were circumstances where Freo were able to get on top, and just due to that sort of stuff I was talking about, the passengers, the skills, they just weren't able to capitalise enough. And that sort of was embodied between like this, those two goals where we just kept, went from the back line, doot, 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 three kicks, bang, got someone an easy shot goal. The two times we did that all game was just a teaser of what can happen if they actually have some bloody gumption and have a crack and try and transition instead of playing kick to kick. Which, unfortunately, seems to be becoming more of a pattern than I'd like to admit from the Dockers. I hope if they can find the balance where they use this sort of methodic discipline method to sort of get the looks they want but I think they just need to have a bit more gumption at this point and back themselves rather than over committing to the system. The first thing I'd like to highlight in the ugly section come up a few times throughout the season so far and that is Frio's ability to score. It's just plain ugly sometimes. In the derby for example most of our points just sort of came in garbage time where the Eagles are taking their foots off the pedal a little bit and the Dockers are like oh Here's a chance we can look less schmucky than we already do. Let's get it down from 60, 70 to 40. We'll get shat on a whole lot less for that, won't we? Yeah! So, yeah, that was great. And then, buddy, just the fact that 69% of Fremantle's disposals were in the defensive half. It just goes back to what I was talking about. The buddy need to have some gumption, need to get a way to launch it out of there rather than just... 45 bloody kick to kick just trying to bloody methodically pick your way through teams teams defensively just are generally too good for that these days you need to find situations where you're getting someone but then they're in a three on one three on two where they can just sort of flick their hands sort of break some lines and stuff and get through to an area where they can kick it beyond the other team's defensive zone just every time Freo was going forward it was just sort of inefficient, bomb it long, pluck a few lucky marks from our big athletic beasts like Swaggy Onions and Jacko, those sort of dudes, Tracy. Just sort of relying on them to consistently do something that is incredibly hard to achieve and that's just plucking contested mark after contested mark in packs of six, seven athletic professional beasts. Like, just the margin on that's silly. I, the offense is just a bit insipid there. And even just the fact we turned it over 15 more times than the Eagles, just like the times it were good that I alluded to, you'd just turn it over and blow it. And then the Eagles kept killing us on the rebound. 
putting our guys that I highlighted, Luke Ryan, Alex Pierce, put them in dangerous situations where even the best defenders in the league are going to struggle when there's a lot of paddock and forwards that can get into it. Just it's an all-around indicting performance, really. And that kind of leads me to another thing that's going to be ugly if it comes to this game, and that is that the Justin Lonemuir whispers, I think, are going to unfortunately come back with an absolute vengeance. Kane Corns is probably just sitting there like that bloody orc in Lord of the Rings going, meat's back on the menu, boys. And by meat, I mean bitching about Justin Lonemuir and his respective media outlets. So I think we're going to be dealing with a lot of that. But the even more unfortunate, ugly thing about that is whether or not these whispers are deserved. For all the reasons I've highlighted, these are things that you can sort of not just attribute to the talent, but they're things that can be attributed to the coach as well. It's just he needs to find a better balance of what he's doing and what he's trying to do, Uh, if that makes any sense. It's kind of hard to buy into the potential Longmuir Whispers as much as there sort of is the issues I've highlighted at the same time. Just because we've had the three losses on the trot, I'd only say really one of those losses is an indictable offence and that would be the latest Eagles loss. That's just egregious, that's terrible. He's going to deserve the spotlight on his head after that one. But if you try and use either the Port or the Carlton games against him, I think that's a bit rough. We looked quite good in both those games. Both those teams are very competitive, going to be thereabouts for Premiership this year. The fact we were a couple of umpiring decisions, a few stuff-ups. I don't want to specifically, exclusively, rather blame the umpires. I'll give them some blame, especially for the Carlton game. But there's ultimately things we could have done better. We could be a better offensive team, as great as we are defensively. We just need that ability to put a few more extra points on the board as just a buffer and insurance from if someone can get on top of our defence. It's just... I think it's an important aspect of the modern game is the ability to score and even in our most successful eras we've never been an offensive juggernaut and I think that's something that we need to work towards a bit more than we currently are. But in conclusion to my first ever bush talk I'd just like to reiterate once again that this is an idea I've had in my head for a while, that this is something I'd be interested in doing on a variety of topics, everything pop culture, political just whatever comes to my mind enough to research and produce a video on I guess a lot of things that frustrate me in this world that I'd like to get off my chest I think the bush talks is a good constructive way to do that probably some more footy related bush talks that I'm more than happy to continue uploading on the true footy channel this is the platform for footy after all but just in general to conclude basically eagles were great lots of young emerging talent Some old guys have come back along for the ride. I think they're going to be a better team than people predicted going into the year. I did say that on the pre-season podcast, but I did not think the Eagles would be last. But maybe I got them and North Melbourne mixed up when I said North Melbourne would be closer to 8 than 18. Maybe that's going to be West Coast, who are closer to 8 than 18. And North Melbourne are going to continue dwelling towards the bottom. Maybe that's how this plays out. I'm still optimistic about North Melbourne. We'll find out next time on Dragon Ball Z about them, but... But yeah, the bloody Dockers. That is quite possibly the worst game of football I've ever seen as a Dockers fan, considering the pre-game expectations, considering everything going into that game. I think that might arguably be the worst Dockers performance I've ever seen in my life, and I think they just needed to be highlighted. So that's why my frustrations (laughs) led to this video. I hope you all enjoyed. Like, comment, subscribe for True Footy, and... Hopefully Bush Talks is back on your frequency soon. This is an experimental shot. Welcome to Bush Talks. I'm the host, Bush, blah, blah, blah. Just want to see how this kind of looks. Pace around a little. A little bit of a song and dance just to see what it looks like.